Okay, can you tell us something about the immediate index function for the three group and the untangling for curves and surfaces? Yes. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. I'm very happy to do this. Uh, before I begin, I have to wave at my sister in Delhi, so now I can start. Okay. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, my joint work with Professor Ilya Kapovich. And uh, the story begins with the theorem of Scott. This is from 1978. And what he showed was that if you start with a closed surface sigma and a hyperbolic metric on it, so of gene is greater than or equal to 2, this closed surface is of gene is greater than or equal to 2, and you take a closed geodesic on it, so this is my closed geodesic, then what we can show is that, in fact, there will be a finite cover of the surface wherein, so this is a finite cover, wherein this closed geodesic untangles. So, you know, it's going to look like that. Right, sorry. So this is a very, uh, a very beautiful result, and there are very, uh, some very interesting questions that arise from this. For instance, you might ask, what can we say about the degree of this cover based on, for example, the length of this geodesic gamma, right? So let me just make a definition before I proceed. So with sigma and rho and gamma as above, we define d rho of gamma to be the smallest degree of a cover sigma hat where gamma hat is untangled. Rho is a hyperbolic metric. Yeah. So. Right. So it, it leads to an embedded loop in the cover. Right. That's what I mean. So we know that this exists. We can define the smallest degree of this cover for any given uh, closed geodesic in our surface to be the function d rho of gamma. Given this, we can then define another function. So I'm going to call this f rho of L. This is the maximum of these d rho of gammas given that, so gamma is closed and the length gamma is less than equal to L. So we take all those geo closed geodesics in here of length less than equal to L, compute these d rho gammas and take the maximum of them and that's our function f rho of L. So it's quantifying the degree of this cover in terms of the length of these geodesics. That's what that's doing, right? So um, here's a result. This is by Patel, Priyam Patel from 2014. So she says that in this setting, there exists a constant which depends on your hyperbolic metric, which says that this function f rho of L must be bigger than uh, less than or equal to CL. L bigger than zero. So her result gives us an upper bound on this function f rho of L, right? And so here, this was our, uh, our motivation. So can we find a lower bound? And at that point, there were no known lower bounds for this function f rho of l, right? And so this was our idea that instead of trying to attack this problem in this scenario, what we can do is instead find lower bounds for analogous functions. In free groups. So we, I'm going to be defining some analogous functions to this function f rho l in the free group case, and we're going to find lower bounds for that. And in fact, our main results are now about uh, these lower bounds in the free group setting, and we can then apply it to sort of get an application in this surface group setting. Right? So that's the idea. Okay. Um, 
So let's see. So let's make some definitions. So uh, I'm going to say that Fn is the free group of rank n. So in this free group of rank n, we say that a non-trivial word G is primitive if G belongs to a free basis. Of Fn, right? So it's primitive if it belongs to a free basis. We say that a non trivial word G is simple if it belongs to a proper free factor. So it's primitive if it's in a free basis. It's simple if it's in a proper free factor. And of course, there is a relationship here between primitive words and simple words. So for instance, if a, if a word is primitive, then in fact, it must be simple. right? And uh, why is that? Because if it belongs to a free basis of Fn, you can consider the group generated by that element, and that will be a proper free factor in there. right? So that's why. OK, so now why are we doing this? We are trying to define those analogous functions in our free group setting. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'm going to define first my primitivity index. Ah, no, I'm jumping ahead. OK, so what I want to say before this is, so there's a result of Marshall Hall from 1949, which basically says this. So you start with a finitely generated subgroup of Fn. So finitely generated. And then it basically says that if you have an element G, which is not in there, which is not in your finitely generated subgroup, then in fact, you can find a finite index subgroup such that Fn sorry, k is contained in H, g is not in H, and k is a free factor. So the point is where they can add, for instance, another element, and you still have a proper subgroup, right? It's not about proper subgroups. Yeah. It's about proper free factors. Free factors. Okay. So it's like uh, okay. oh, similar okay. to being a subshop. Okay, good. Okay. good. It's the fact. Okay. And is that related to subgroups of probabilities of all things? Yes. That's yes. What that's so that's yes. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's exactly the point. And so um, what we can do is uh, we can. A free factor, so uh, in here, so if you have a, a group F, a group A and B. So A is a free factor of B if B can be written as A free product, A star. Uh, look, I mean, 
something else a yeah a prime i i call it a1 <laughs> yeah something else okay um so um what we can do here is we can apply this result with uh you know you take a non trivial element g you take the subgroup generated by it you ca call that your k and you apply this result and what this will then tell you is that for every non trivial element g in your free group there is in fact a finite index subgroup of g i'm i don't know why i just called it g okay. finite index such that g is in h and g is primitive in h that's what we get right by applying exactly this to where k is a subgroup generated by g this is what we get so now this is all sort of already building on this analogy because now what we can ask is how uh, what can we say about the index in which this g becomes uh, be becomes primitive as opposed to here asking what can we say about the degree of the cover in which this gamma entangles right that's the that's the question so okay so this is my primitivity index for g non trivial we say that d of g is the minimum of the index of the subgroup in which g is primitive so that compares to this function here and then you can correspondingly define the primitivity index function which is going to be defined for n bigger than or equal to 1 and i say that this is the maximum of these d of g where g is of length between 1 and n and g is not So the reason why we add this extra condition is because this function d of g does not behave well under taking powers, and in fact, uh, you can show that d of you know some uh, so if a is a primitive element, then d of a to the n is actually exactly n. So to avoid that behavior, we sort of add in this extra condition here. We don't want to consider these g in 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 finding this uh, function f of n. Is that okay? Yeah. And. Yes, yes. Yes. Yes, exactly. You fix a basis. So. Okay. And within this fixed basis, that's how you define it. Yes, exactly. Okay. So, uh just like we did we defined two notions there, primitivity and simplicity. So, just like I did this for primitive for primitivity, I can do the same thing for simplicity. So, this is my simplicity in that and you can imagine what that is right for non trivial g the notation i'm going to use is d not this is the minimum of these indices where now g is simple and again the simplicity index function that is going to be f not n and here we actually don't need that special condition because like we just discussed the simplicity index function is okay under taking powers it behaves well okay so this is exactly analogous to the situation right so you're replacing the length of your geodesic by the length of your of your word and uh, so these functions fn and uh, f not n are what we are trying to bound now find lower bounds for right upper, upper and lower yes <laughs> okay So it turns out in this situation actually finding upper bounds is very straightforward so let's just see quickly how You can take uh, surfaces with functions right some I mean but can you realize the free with the functional 
you can you can take a subsurface which will which will be whose whose fundamental group will be free. Okay, um, so actually, because we saw that primitive words are simple, this shows that in fact, you know, uh, um, so d naught of g is always going to be less than or equal to d of g, and in fact, you can show that d of g is less than or equal to. So this is the cyclically reduced. length of g, which is always less than the length of g, which we said was n, right? And so this statement then shows that f naught is less than f n is less than n. So let's see why this is true, because if this is true, then that is true. So um, I'm just going to wave my hands a little here. What you do is that you start with the g, which is non-trivial, and which is cyclically reduced. Once you have this g, you can write it on a circle of simplicial length n, right? That's something we can do because our g we assume to be cyclically reduced. So now we have a graph which is a circle and is a base point. Okay. <laughs> so this is what you do. Start with a base point. There are n vertices here, so you know, I don't know, x1 up to xn, and you can read your word g as you go along the circle. So what you can do is in this graph with this base point you can you can complete this to a cover of your of your you know rows so you can a1 a2 a3 an so i can complete this picture to a to a finite cover of this without adding any extra vertices by just adding in edges right that's something that i'm allowed to do and the moment i do that the picture i end up with is exactly corresponds to uh, exactly corresponds to a finite index subgroup of uh, F A, right? And in that finite index subgroup, because of the way we constructed this, my element G is going to be primitive, right? And the index, because we didn't add any vertices, the index of that subgroup is exactly n, and so uh, we're good. Is that is that good? Is that one? Yeah. Okay. So that's why this upper bound is relatively straightforward. The idea, of course, now is to try and find a lower bound. So. You need to add edges, right? You need to add edges. So this is this is right now. This is not a cover of of that rose, right? So I mean, a simpler example would be. Let's take the free group on two generators, right? This is A, this is B, right? If I have something like this, you know, maybe this is my A and this is my B. This is not a cover, right? But I can complete this to a cover by sort of adding in this B and adding in this A. Right, so I'm assuming here that this A B was my word, my initial cyclically reduced word. Okay, and now in this, in, so this represents now a, a finite index subgroup of index two in F A B, and in there, this A B is going to be primitive. And you can always do this. So, okay. Um, so here is uh, so here are some results. So we start with the with W n, which is going to be a long random word in F A of length n. Right, and. Um, so when I say a long random word in FA of length n, I mean you take your length n, and then you pick 
your, so you, you want to pick your letters from your FA to form this word W, and you pick them uniformly and randomly, right? So for the first, for the first letter, you're going to have two times capital N options in your free group of, of you know, rank capital N. For the next one, you have two N minus one options and so on, right? That's how you, that's how you pick. Because you, you, want, you want it to be freely reduced. Okay, so, um, so this is, The result, so it says that let n be bigger than equal to 2, let fn be the free group of rank n, then there exists a constant bigger than 0 such that for n bigger than equal to 1, limit of n goes to infinity. So this is the result, and this is a probabilistic statement. It's saying that uh, when you fix your, the rank of your group, uh, if you pick a, a word which is long enough, if you pick a random word which is long enough, then its uh, simplicity index is going to be bigger than or equal to this function here, right? What so that's what. Sorry? Mu n. Oh yes, mu n is the uniform probability distribution on you know the you, you take spheres of radius n and you take the uniform probability distribution on them and that's what mu n stands for. Yeah. Okay, is that, is that okay? So, um, so from here, again, because of the fact, because of what we saw about upper bounds on, because of this fact here, that f naught of n is less than equal to f n is less than equal to n, from here, this, th it follows immediately that actually uh, there exists a constant c1 greater than zero such that follows immediately that this is true. So now we want, to th uh, we want to talk a little bit about why we can say this and how we can find this bound. And then we'll see how we can apply this to the surface space. Okay. So here is a result of Stallings from 1996, and it says that W in Fn is Fa is simple. So if W, if, if you if you have a simple simple word in your free group, then the whitehead graph of W contains So he's giving us a criteria for, 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 sim for simple words, which say that if something is simple, then its whitehead graph will contain a cut vertex. I will just now sort of define what, what we mean by whitehead graph and also what we mean by a cut vertex, right? So what's a whitehead graph? So um, again, it's a graph. I'm trying to describe a graph, which means I need to tell you what my vertices are and what my edges are. So um, again, I, I fix a free basis. So you have to fix a, fi fix a free basis. So the vertices of my, oh, so actually let's start with the W, which is cyclically reduced. And let C be the first letter of W. If W is cyclically reduced, then WC is going to be freely reduced. And I have to define it like this because I want to define the edges depend very much on the subwords in this word WC, right? That's where the edges come from. So what are my vertices? So my vertices of this graph, this whitehead graph, those are just the disjoint union of A union A inverse. So just you know the alphabet, that, that's your vertices. How do you add edges? So
so for any two vertices a and b in your in the in the set of vertices uh, there is an edge between a inverse and b is a b or b inverse a inverse occurs as a subject so like i said the 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 edges come from looking at uh, length two subwords of this of this word w c right so for example let's just see an example suppose my w is a b b then w c is a b b a so my vertices are going to be a a inverse b b inverse and let's add edges so the first two letter subword is a b which means i need an edge from a inverse to b next i have b b so i need an inverse i need an edge from b inverse to b so that's there and finally b a so that's an edge from again b inverse to a so that's what that gives you right and these white head graphs are very useful because for example here they're telling us when you know what happens for example if the word we begin with is simple so let me define quickly what a cut vertex was so a cut vertex so x in some graph gamma is a cut vertex if delta minus x is disconnected so when you remove that cut vertex your graph becomes disconnected so for instance here if i remove my b i lose these edges and my graph will then become disconnected so this is a cut vertex right okay so here is a key observation here again if i start with my free group on that if that's my free basis then so this is a1 a1 inverse a2 a2 inverse a n a n inverse so in this case if my white head graph looks like that there is no cut vertex here right there's no one vertex that you can remove which will disconnect this graph and so in that case you can show you can uh, from 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 stalling theorem you know that in this case w is not right right if it contains this uh, this sort of circuit through all of the vertices this is not of course a necessary condition but it's sufficient right and that's what uh, we are going with so for one I for for instance one situation in which this will show up this will happen for certain is if a certain so we can look at so we so we are trying to construct this graph for a cyclically reduced word w so we can ask ourselves what sort of substrings should w have to ensure that this happens right so for example so if w contains right if it contains that subword then we, when we are doing this process to draw the white graph of w it is going to automatically contain this cycle in here and so you're good because then you can show that this w in fact is not simple in your original group right okay um so let's see okay so now what i want to do i should not have erased that but i did okay so uh, let me rewrite this
So this was basically the statement. Uh, so now what I want to do is uh, I want to do two things at the same time. I want to sort of uh, throw some light on why that mysterious one third term sh shows up there. And I want to talk about what we're really trying to do is we're going to try and prove that by contradiction. So what we want to do is we want to build towards a sufficient condition that allows us to break simplicity, right? That's the goal that we're working towards and that's what we want to do next. But before I do that, um, I, I want to share this uh, truism that I came across a few months ago at a talk and it was this, that a good talk should have one joke and one proof and they should not be the same thing. And so, so, so that's the joke, exactly. So, so that's the joke. And I'm going to assure you now that the proof will certainly not be the same in this talk. <laughs> okay. So um, uh, what I want to say next is that in a key idea in proving this result is a very technical proposition. But uh, the sort of the idea of proof behind that proposition draws from a, a, a simpler result. And in there, you can really see the proof sort of shine. And that result is actually due to uh, Barishnikov. So I just want to sort of illustrate that for now. So this is, so here's a lemma. And this is Barishnikov. So we start with n bigger than or equal to 2. And we show that there exists a constant which depends only on n such that the following things happen. So for any finite cover of your, so this is my n rows. So I'm speaking to be for cover So in this situation, I can show that there exists a freely reduced word v whose length is this constant. So it's, its length is bound by the square of this, the degree of this cover, whose length is equal to that, such that for every, so this is a little wordy, just bear with me. So for every vertex x, in your graph V gamma, in your vertex set V gamma, the path P x V So the idea here is that uh, you can find a constant which depends only on the rank of your free group, such that if you take any uh, finite cover of your rows, you can depend depending on this graph gamma, you can find a freely reduced word v of length, which is this is important, it's bound by d squared, such that if from any starting at any vertex in this graph, I can so I can read any word, right? Because this is you know because it's a regular cover, I know that. Uh, uh, every vertex in there is 2, 2 n regular. So I can read anything I want. So starting at any vertex, I read the path with label v, and doing so will force me to go through every topological edge in my graph gamma. Right? So let's see how you would go about showing this. So we're going to exploit some nice things that we know already about gamma because of the fact that it's a, it's, a, it's a finite cover of my rows. I know, for example, that it is connected. It has d vertices, right? It's 2n uh, it's, uh, regular, and it has nd topological edges, right? In particular, the, the thing that you really exploit is the fact, so you can actually, sorry, you can use, you can assume that this is a directed graph where the edges are labeled just by positive letters in your A. Right, that's what you can assume here. And so because it's a directive graph where every vertex is 2n regular, graph theory tells us that there is an Euler circuit from star to star 
that of course goes through every topological edge exactly once, right? So because this exists, uh, we assume, so we let the label of this Euler circuit be our freely reduced word V1. And it's important to note here that it's V1 because of the way we, we uh, uh, what because of the things we assumed about gamma, it consists only of positive letters and no negative letters. And because it goes, this goes through every topological edge exactly once, the length of V1 is exactly ND, capital N, because of the number of edges, topological edges in our graph. So now we sort of run an algorithm. We start by enumerating our vertices. So there are D of them, so X1 to Xt. Here X1 is, you know, say star. Then what you do is, there was nothing sacrosanct, no, no, not yet. So you start from X2 and you read a path with label V1. Again, something you can do because this graph is 2N uh, uh, regular. This path will terminate somewhere. So let it terminate at some vertex, say V1. But just like we could find that Euler circuit from star, we can do the same at Z1 because there was nothing special about star. So you find this Euler circuit at Z1, and this is so. The label of that is your V2. That's your next word. So this sort of defines the algorithm that you run. You do it for every vertex, a x1 to xd, and then you're going to basically get d of those words, v1, v2, up to vd. So what we end up with is that we define our word v to be v1, v2, up to vd. This is a freely reduced word because there's no cancellation in this concatenation anywhere because we are only considering positive letters, right? So we are good. And the length of this word, in fact, here is precisely n d squared because each of these vi's are of length capital N D, right? Okay, so this sort of uh, illustrates what we want to do in the more technical proposition that we require to prove that. So let me state that proposition. So that proposition again says that let N be bigger than or equal to two. So this is so this is uh, like you can see it's more technical but what this is saying is that you are in the same setting you can find a constant that only depends on the rank of your free group and here instead of requiring that your word V passes through every uh, topological edge of gamma you instead want it to contain the simplicity breaking string that we talked about earlier, right? So that string was, if you remember, it was a n squared all the way up to a one squared. Here I start by, you know, fi finding a free basis for this, for the fundamental group of this graph, which I can do. And that basis I call b1 to br. So I now I want that in my string v forces me to go through a subpath whose label is exactly this uh, uh, simplicity breaking subword. 
is that is that fine? And the proof is, you know, very. It fo follows that same idea, except it's sort of more technical because you know you can't assume that your concatenation just works and gives you free reduced words at every stage. That's why, and that's why you have that added. Oh yeah, so this was the point. This three is the, is that mysterious, the reason behind that mysterious one third over there, and it's it's one degree up because of the complication that comes from concatenation in this in this scenario. Okay, so what do we do with this? So um, we're trying to show that, right? So we start with a suitable C naught, and we want to show that D naught of W n is bigger than or equal to C naught of log n to the one third. So you assume that it's not. So suppose you know D, which is D naught of I'm going to call it W instead of W n, is less than. So that means that you can find a finite index subgroup of F n of index exactly d, wherein this w becomes uh, simple, right? That's what it means. So I can find, I can draw that same picture here. And so this w is down here. So I can assume that you know it corresponds to a closed loop in this graph from star to star, such that gamma. So I have this situation. So what I can do is run this algorithm in this setting on this graph gamma star. And I can find this word v, which satisfies these things, which forces me to contain this sort of uh, simplicity breaking subword. And what that shows is that the length of this v now is less than equal to you know, the c times d cubed. But then d was less than that, so this is less than c times c naught times log n. And now we use some, uh, you know, some sophisticated probability arguments, which show that in this case, uh, this word, this, this long word w is forced to contain all subwords, all freely reduced subwords of this length. So in particular, it's forced to contain this length v, this, 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 this subword v. And because that happens, we show that in this case, because this degree is too small, W forced to contain V as a subword, which then shows that. Okay. Uh, in the subgroup that's represented by this. And that sort of basically gives you the result, right? And now it, 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 it turns out that you can sort of, uh, there's a very nice way to uh, apply this, this, this lower bound in the surface scenario. So what you do is, so the, the reason is that, so this is a fact.
the reason is that uh, if you have a compact connected surface with you know these nice properties that greater than or equal to two boundary components, every simple closed curve in there corresponds to a simple element of the fundamental group. So what you do in our original picture is that instead of looking at sigma d, you take a subsurface like a pair of pants in there, where the fundamental group is going to be free of rank bigger than or equal to two, and then because you can find these corresponding simple elements in the in the cover you run these exact same lower bounds and the result is this. So those same lower bounds end up giving you know the same lower bounds in the surface case, right? So this is this is uh, what we had then. Recently, there is a, a result of Jonah Gaster. This is from you know January this year, and he basically showed that there exists a constant, and his constant depends only on the surface, not on the metric. Such that f rho L is super than one is to C one L. So he showed that you can actually find a linear lower bound for the same function F of L. And in fact, you know, if you combine a Priam re Priam's result and Jonah's result, what you end up with is this. Priam's constant depends on the metric where so C one L so this is what we have and where we sort of end. But again, we don't really know anything. So uh, jo uh, Ga uh, Jonah Gaster he uses a sort of uh, geometric arguments to show this. He considers a very very specific sort of sequence of curves which he studies to get to this bound, but uh, nobody really knows what happens to, you know, with just an arbitrary sequence of curves, how this function f rho l really sort of behaves. That's really something that we don't know anything about. Right, sequences of. Right, right. I think that's just sort of the the method of his proof that no, that. But I think he's he's is metric C, right? I can't So 
they they so what we exploit is is that fact over there right but the fact uh, but but there uh, is no um, you have uh, drawn a picture so uh, when you take this subsurface you know this uh, on the on the top is to a random rock right you know this this is a subsurface is like a pair of pants and uh, so when you take a curve there basically the word length of the curve and the hyperbolic length of the curve are roughly the same yeah. Yeah. so that's but ultimately, yes, so you didn't draw this picture, so we take the subsurface like a pair of pants, we look at this free group, you know, the final group which is free, and we do this uh, random walk there and apply our free group result. And then with this fact, it gives you the fact that the lengths uh, are basically the same. Uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the same idea does it help to use Pascal's result to get some lower bound in the free group? Uh, no, no, no. Unfortunately, his ideas are purely topological. So, and if you look at his elements, uh, you know they have d zero equal to one or something. I mean, actually, they'll. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, I okay. mean, so you see, it's so actually. It's wrong, it's wrong uh, uh, I mean, it's basically much harder to get uh, lower bounds for this. Uh, free group. Uh, in the free group Apple. case, you know, uh, ah. then. Uh, in, in a more constrained topological situation, you know, so you know that's why even though he has uh, linear low bounds, you know, for in the surface case, you know, our result remains to be the best, and I think it's actually pretty hard, you know, to improve it. Yeah. You know, so, but it it's still interesting, you know, what's what actually going on there. Really yeah. nice to know whether the expected value is polynomial. Mm. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah I, I mean, I'm actually doing an IGL mm -hmm. project, you know, so this Nyaka and a bunch of uh, undergraduate students where we eventually hope to get to some simulations to see what's, uh, you know, what's actually going on, mm -hmm. but it, it is pretty hard, yeah. Uh, so for now, you know, we only have theoretical results. I mean, it may be that on these random elements, the actual behavior is linear. Maybe they're just not smart enough. <laughs> 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 you calculate some entropy and then make either linear or zero. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. Anything else? Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>